Welcome back to part 3 of Mutating DNA, your guide to site-directed mutagenesis. Today, we'll be discussing the final results of our lab and why they are so. But first, let's recall that DNA produces the code for putting amino acids together to make proteins. Our procedures for the past two days went as follows. We designed the primer by choosing a specific nucleotide that will change the amino acid structure in the DNA and we then consulted our genetic code table to find the correct amino acids to mutate to create that proper protein mutation. Once we have located our amino acid that we want to change, we begin to design the primer and take special care to make sure that the mutated primer will anneal to the bacterial DNA. But we have to make sure it's a strong bond, and we did this by making sure that the DNA section starts and ends with a C or a G, so it has the strongest bond possible. To make sure we were correct, we plugged in our sections into the equation temperature equals A's plus T's times 2 plus C's plus G's times 4. And if the section works, then we would have it sent to a lab to be fabricated. Once we get our primers back, we mix them with the plasmids in the PCR tube and added nucleotides and DNA polymerase to begin the pre-CR process in the thermocycler. The temperature heated and split the DNA strands so the primer could move in and bond with the DNA when it was cooled. Then the thermocycler raised the temperature and used polymerase to elongate the primer. This process happened over and over again, overnight, multiplying the mutated DNA. The PCR process makes multiple copies of the mutated plasmid DNA, but it doesn't get rid of the original GFP. We added DPN1 to digest the remaining unaltered GFP DNA. Remember, after that process of multiplying and digesting the DNA was completed, we had to move on to our final step, the long-awaited transformation. As we remember, this occurs when foreign DNA is introduced to our bacterial cell through the transformation process. If done correctly, this process will introduce the new plasmid to the bacterial DNA and it will begin to make proteins through protein synthesis. In this process, the RNA generated by RNA synthesis is read by a ribosome, which then constructs the new protein from various amino acids. In order to construct the new protein, tRNA must carry in amino acids and attach them to the site within the ribosome. tRNA works because it has a specific structure that exposes a single anticodon, which matches the complementary codon of the RNA. When this new protein is completed, it will fluoresce either blue or yellow instead of green. If you notice on your plate that one half still glows green and the other half glows blue or yellow, that means that your experiment was a success. Remember in this lab that there is a controlled protein and a mutated non-controlled protein. The controlled DNA still has the original GFP DNA that still glows green because it was only replicated through PCR and not mutated. The mutated DNA, which was incubated and multiplied, will express proteins that will glow blue or yellow. If your protein did not glow blue or yellow, or didn't glow at all, then there are several possibilities as to why it didn't work, such as an improper PCR mixture due to bad pipetting technique, or improper storage of ingredients such as enzymes like polymerase that can be very temperature sensitive. Don't worry though, even great lab scientists can make mistakes. The reason we did this lab was not just to mutate GFP to YFP or BFP, it was to understand the process of site-directed mutagenesis and understand the correlation of structure to function. And we also had the opportunity to perform a lab procedure that is frequently used by scientists. Remember that the structure of the amino acids in a protein are coded by the DNA in a cell, and that changes in that structure will affect the function of those proteins. This lab shows us that manipulating just one specific piece of DNA can change the entire function and purpose of a protein.